for today is Dr. Susan Gishui. It's with great pleasure that I introduce my teacher, um, mentor, my supervisor, Dr. Gishui from Kenya. Welcome, sir. Um, Dr. Gishui <laughs> is a consultant ophthalmologist and senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi, Department of Ophthalmology. He has great interest in evidence-based medicine and he loves to teach. He got his MBCHB and uh, MMED ophthalmology at the University of Nairobi. And he also got his MSc in epidemiology and PhD from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His main area of interest are research, clinical trials, and systematic reviews. He has published extensively on ocular surface squamous neoplasia, and he believes in health practitioners and policymakers in African countries need to seek evidence and rigorously evaluate the evidence that we collect and use it with the meager resources that we have in Africa. So with this introduction, Dr. Bishu, we are most yeah. welcome to this journal class tonight by the Zambia Society. Yeah, I am there now. With this introduction, yeah. I think I Thank I will you. ask uh, our presenter, Dr. Chansa, to probably share a screen. I don't know if Dr. Gishui has any words that he wants to share before we start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Funjika, for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to see you and to see many colleagues who uh, trained in our department in Nairobi. And we are very proud to see that you now have started your own program in your country. So. For me, this is an honor that I would like to say thank you for. And uh, without much further ado, we will let Dr. Mabel Chansa go ahead with her presentation. And I suppose we will have a question and answer session at the end of her presentation. And then I'll present something at the end that Dr. Mumbi had asked me to present on systematic reviews, um, just for the last maybe 10 or 15 minutes of this session. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mumbi, I'm unable to share my screen. I think I need to be um, allowed to share the screen. Yeah, uh, are you able to, to do it now? Just try. I think I've allowed multiple participants. Uh, please try to see if you can share. Okay. Okay. I can now. Thank you. Okay. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we are. Okay. So, uh, good evening once again to everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present this week's Journal Club presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Mabel Chansa, as earlier mentioned, from Andola Teaching Hospital, ophthalmology registrar, and my moderator is Dr. Gishui from uh, Kenya. So uh, our topic of discussion mainly today is based on uh, research methodology, in particular systematic reviews and uh, meta-analysis. However, uh, I'll give a brief, just uh, brief pointers on keratoconus, then we can move straight on into the general uh, critiquing, assessment and critiquing. So keratoconus, as we know, is a cornea ectasia that degrades the optical function of the cornea. And usually, in most patients, it will appear in the second decade of life. This is when we see most of our patients presenting. And it affects about 86, uh, in a ratio of 86 uh, patients in 1,000 people. So it's very important for us to have a knowledge of natural, the natural history of uh, keratoconus, as this will help us to understand uh, the different treatment modalities that we have currently available and how best uh, we can apply these uh, modalities based on understanding how this disease will progress if there's, there, there are no interventions that have been put in place. So moving straight on into our journal article. Our journal is from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, Volume 126, Issue 7. This was published in July of 2019, and the title is Keratoconus Natural Progression. And it was a systematic review and meta-analysis of 11,521, 29, sorry. 
The study purpose was to describe the natural history of keratoconus, and the authors based this on the vision, refraction, and corneal curvature of the patients that were in the studies that were included in this meta-analysis. In terms of the study setting, we understand that this is a meta-analysis and uh, studies were coming from various regions of the world. Therefore, we did not have a specific study setting, but the study setting was stated in the particular or individual studies that were included in the meta-analysis. In terms of the eligibility criteria, the inclusion criteria consisted of prospective and retrospective studies, uh, which were including patients that had untreated keratoconus. And the key feature was that the following outcomes or measures were taken into consideration. So there was visual acuity. In particular, they were looking at the best corrected visual acuity, as well as uncorrected visual acuity. Uh, they were also looking at refraction, and as well as uh, corneal curvature measures. So of note is the maximum keratometry, or the KMAT. This is the parameter that was concentrated on, although all these other parameters as stated on the slide were taken into consideration. So uh, they also included uh, studies with 10 or more patients who had untreated, um, who, are, who belong to any uh, cohort of patients who are untreated for at least six months of follow-up. In terms of the exclusion criteria, uh, the patients who are belonging to study cohorts uh, with subclinical or home first keratoconus, these were not considered, as well as patients with other ocular comorbidities. So here, an example of um, keratoconjunctivitis was given, as well as uh, 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 studies that were, uh, take, were done on uh, ex vivo, that were done ex vivo or uh, animal studies. And then also uh, other cohorts that were excluded were those that consisted ex exclusively of pregnant or breastfeeding women. In terms of the study search methods, as we are told, even from the title of the study, they considered 11,529 eyes, which uh, were taken from 41 publications that were reporting the natural history of keratoconus. So this 41 publication, as we get to see later in the flow diagram, were the number of studies that were included in the systematic review. But later on, when they began doing the meta-analysis, the total number of studies included was 22. Um, a, a systematic review was performed uh, according to the PRISMA, the preferred reporting items for systematic and meta-analysis review statement guidelines. And then a search, a search strategy was also developed uh, so that they could identify all the articles that were uh, discussing natural history of the component. And uh, the, they used databases as those, the ones that have been uh, highlighted on this slide. In terms, of, in terms of the study search methods, they also uh, included further, they included unpublished trials, which were identified through the meta register or in controlled databases. And they also searched for gray literature through the open gray uh, database. Um, it's important to note that the authors also took into consideration the fact that some studies did not appear in English. And so these studies were not included. These studies were included and uh, they made sure that they used the translation software so that they could be able uh, to uh, to interpret the English, uh, uh, the non-English based reports. In terms of study selection, in terms of study selection, data was extracted by a single author, and uh, the author used a standardized form, which included a study design, inclusion and exclusion criteria, as well as uh, baseline characteristics and the outcome data. And uh, they also took note of those studies that had some duplicates and all those studies that had uh, patient cohorts so that they could examine for additional data. In terms of data collection, like I've mentioned, furthermore, they also took into uh, consideration the aspects of biasment. So the Joanna Briggs Institute, of, Institute model of evidence-based healthcare uh, bias, biasment assessment was used. So in particular, they used this tool 
to assess uh, the randomized controlled trials, as well as the prospective and retrospective studies. In terms of data analysis, they also took into consideration the outcome measures. So they, uh, they were recorded in a standardized data extraction form, uh, as mentioned, and uh, the data was reported in a maximum period of 12 months. So the patients were followed up for 12 months. And uh, in terms of vision, the vision was reported according to the log my chart. In terms of statistical analysis, differences in paired means were calculated for each study that was included for each outcome variable. And if in an event that the particular study being looked at did not have a report on standard deviation, uh, the authors used other features of the statistical uh, aspects such as use of the p-values and confidence intervals in order to, cal to, to calculate as well as the standard errors. And eventually a meta-analysis was, uh, meta was performed using a random effect model. So uh, furthermore, a multivariate imputation by change equations was used for, that, uh, for those studies that had some missing data and summary statistics from regression models were reported. Uh, eventually, the information was uh, displayed graphically using forest plots as well as scatter plots. And, if, and ultimately, a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered to be statistically significant. So in terms of the results that were indicated in the study, uh, this diagram here is a prisma flow chart, which just shows us how the studies, how the authors came up with the 23 studies that were eventually included in their meta-analysis. So uh, when we go through, we'll establish how um, the various uh, records or studies were excluded based on missing information. And eventually, there were 23 studies included. So moving on, we have here um, a forest plot of a maximum keratometry, which is KMAX, over the 12 month low mean change in diopters. So, this was assessing um, the change in the KMAX in the 12 months that were included in the study. So, if we look at um, our, our, our image here, we can see that um, there was a change of about 0 0.7 diopters in the in the K-max in the Middle Eastern group. And then eventually, sorry, not 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is the general, that was the general change, the overall change when uh, the subgroup analysis was compiled in total. But in terms of uh, the general picture, we can tell that in the subgroup analysis, they considered the Middle Eastern group, the European group, as well as the East African, East Asian group. So um, eventually, we can tell that um, the, the Middle Eastern group had the greatest change, with a change of 1.2 compared to the other, other groups that were included in the subgroup analysis. In, this, in our next diagram, we see a scatter plot here, with an, which, which is representing the effects of baseline K-max on 12 month roaming change in the K-max for each study that was included in the KMAX. So the conclusion of the authors was that um, there was generally, the change was noticed, the greatest change was noticed in the younger uh, population, which was shown on another scatter plot. But in this particular one, the, the plotting was done on 12-month um, KMAX change uh, against baseline max which uh, showed that for every five diopter change, there was a one, a one diopter 12 month change that was observed in general. In terms of the mean keratometry over 12 months from mean change in diopters, uh, it was noted that of all the studies that were included, there was a 0 0.39 diopter change uh, with the confidence interval as indicated, the range as indicated here, at 95% confidence interval. And if we take note uh, in this first plot, as compared to the other one that we have shown for the subgroup analysis, here the studies uh, seem to overlap, which shows that there was uh, uh, less variation in comparison to uh, the during the subgroup analysis. 
So this showed that also there was uh, less variation and there were some overlaps and there were minimal differences in the studies that were included in this particular uh, uh, meta-analysis. Furthermore, uh, this forest was, shows us the spherical equivalent refraction, 12 month long mean change in directors in the studies. So again, we see here that there was a um, negative 0.44 dioxide change uh, at 0.61, and sorry, at a, at a confidence interval ranging from negative 0.61 and at 95% confidence interval. So here again, we can appreciate that even here, the studies, there wasn't a very big variation in the studies that were included. And of all the studies that were here, the study by Wittig and Silver 2014, is the one that gave, uh, which had a greater weighted value as a well from our square here in comparison to the other studies. So other aspects that were considered in the study were the best corrected visual acuity, thinnest pachymetry, study protocol, heterogeneity, as well as patient reported outcomes. So in terms of the visual acuity, the meta-analysis study showed that from the 12 studies included, in, in the, in the meta-analysis, there was a change in best corrected visual acuity at 12 months of 0 0.004 log months at 95% confidence interval. And it was also noted uh, that there was a low heterogeneity, and this meaning that there was a low variance, uh, variation rather, in the studies at, uh, over, with a percentage of less than 25%. In terms of the thinnest pachymetry, Eight studies were included in this meta-analysis, and it was noticed that there was a high heterogeneity of 95%, but this was not considered to be, um, uh, it, was, it, it was clinically significant in the sense that um, the reduction was not significant enough in the, in the pachymetry readings, uh, of, which was stated to be negative 5 micrometers at 95% confidence interval. In terms of the variations in the study, which is the heterogeneity, uh, it was noticed overall that there was a high heterogeneity among studies, which were reported for um, measures such as visual acuity, topography, and pachymetry. And also, though it was noted that there was a poor reporting of the keratometry measurement. And uh, this was noted that the protocol itself that was used for the study had poor reporting of the keratometry measurement. And then in terms of um, the patient reported outcomes, it was noted that there was limited uh, data for this uh, measure. And so it was very difficult to uh, take the information as it was presented because I think of all the studies that they had used, only one study, the CLEP, was the one that uh, reported this patient reported outcome significantly in order to consider it in this meta-analysis. So in terms of the author's interpretation, it was established that younger patients progress more aggressively. That, and so it's important for those patients who are less than 17 years uh, to be followed up very well because it's possible that they're likely to have a, a greater uh, KMAX pro progression of more than 1.5 diopters. Then also patients with stiffer KMAX demonstrated a uh, more severe progression ultimately. It was also noted that the Middle Eastern patients uh, experienced more progression. This is in comparison to patients from other regions. However, other measures such as visual acuity, refraction, and pachymetry uh, were, were thought to be less sensitive measures of progression than topography. So in this sense, we could then say that according to the authors, topography was the one that we could rely on to assess um, the topography's progression because the other features seemed to be less sensitive for this parameter. In terms of recommendations, the authors established that lower threshold for early cross-linking is important in young patients, given the, impe the increased risk of topographic progression. And then also patients with a stiffer KMAX uh, needed closer follow-up, especially if this stiffer KMAX was noted at initial presentation. And then also that it, is, it would be very important to carry out further studies in order to identify any ethnic influence on keratoconus progression. So that was a general overview of the study itself. 
we move to the critical appraisal. So in terms of the critical appraisal, we are going to use the MOOC guidelines for meta-analysis and systematic reviews and observational studies. So on this slide, um, I apologize, I know it's a bit crowded, but the essence is just for us to appreciate that this is the general overview of the guidelines, the most guidelines, and this is how they appear. So we are going to uh, tackle each aspect um, individually and then analyze our study accordingly. So we, be, we begin with the background reporting. So in terms of the problem definition, we can say that the authors did uh, define the problem. They told us from the introduction that in their own observation, there was few, there was few literature on uh, keratoconus natural progression, hence the need to carry out this study. The hypothesis statement was not given in this particular study. Uh, one would think that this is probably because usually meta-analysis uh, will focus on, um, on, on more observational studies and intervention, not necessarily like a hypothesis statement will be given for studies that have more to do with an intervention where you're trying to assess the impact of an intervention on a particular group, uh, which was not the case in this uh, particular study. So this could be the reason why the authors did not give the hypothesis statement. Then in terms of description of study outcomes, it was done. And the study outcomes, they tell us from the beginning that it was based on vision, uh, reduction, and corneal preservation. Then the type of exposure on the intervention used would be why informed. They were considering patients that had keratoconus. And they also tell us the type of study design that was used. They mentioned that uh, they, they, it's the randomized control trials, uh, prospective and retrospective trials. However, they could have also considered cohort studies, as these, these studies also are uh, able to give um, adequate information in terms of meta analysis. Then in terms of the study population, the, the authors tell us that this, they searched available existing data. So existing here, um, we, we, we take the word of the authors that it was all the existing information. However, there's a possibility that they could have missed some studies which are, are, are present out there. Then in terms of the reporting of methods, so that several aspects were considered, but of note, we could say that um, the assessment of study, uh, the study quality was included. So, and they also, and include the including of blinding of assessors and stratification, regression, and possible predictors of study results. So on this aspect, the authors were not very clear and we don't uh, really uh, get to see all the measures that that were put in place in order for them to assess, assess these measures. However, one of the positive things was that they did assess for heterogeneity, as they tell us, and you can see it even in our results. And then also they provide us with an appropriate tables and graphics, as we saw from the forest plot and the, and the scatter plot. However, they do not give us um, graphical yeah, representation of all the information. You'll notice that some of the information uh, is not represented graphically, especially when it comes to the aspects of uh, visual acuity and some of the refraction outcomes that were established during the study. In terms of reporting of results, so the, the authors gave us a graphic summary of individual study estimates and overall estimates, as we have already established. And also, uh, they gave us results of sensitivity testing. And this was done by the subgroup analysis that we saw that was based on the regions from which the studies came from. There was also an indication of statistical uncertainty of findings where they, are, they, they mentioned the fact that it's possible that some of the, the results could have other features which would influence. For instance, it, it, the other measures other than topography could have been less sensitive to achieving the, the main uh, outcome of the study, which was to establish the keratoconus natural progression. So this shows that the, they were also taking into consideration the other aspects that could cause um, some changes in the findings. In terms of reporting of discussion, so they, they, they do inform us that they used a quantitative assessment, which is the, the Joanna Briggs 
um, for the for establishing biasness, and they also did um, justify their exclusion criteria. Although in terms of language, uh, they clearly state that they did not exclude any studies. So in this case, there was no exclusion. So this is also stated, and they went further to look for um, uh, other software that they could use to interpret the, the studies that were not put in English. Then furthermore, they also did an assessment of quality of the included studies, as we uh, saw earlier. In terms of reporting of conclusions, there was a consideration of alternative explanations for the observed results, and there's gener there was also generalization of the conclusions, and also the authors took time to give us guidelines for the future research, and as we, I mentioned earlier, they actually told us that they need uh, to carry out further studies also to establish as aspects of ethnicity in that regard. Uh, however, the authors did not give us um, the source of their funding. So uh, having critiqued our article, we can then uh, try to establish whether we can extrapolate the results that we, that we see from the meta-analysis to the Zambian setting. So there were aspects of heterogeneity, as we have discussed. So we, we noticed that there's a wide variation in the study findings uh, in some of the variables, in the variables. So even with the corneal uh, curvature, we noticed that um, it, the stat, it's not all the studies that were falling within the same confidence intervals. And it also gives us uh, a general picture that there were a lot of, there were a lot of differences in the studies that were included. So this may, this may pose a challenge in terms of extrapolation of the results. Then uh, in terms of ethnicity, um, this study was carried out in other regions. We see that it was in Europe, in East Asia. And so it does not um, take into account other aspects such as our African setup. Therefore, based on this, this study, we would not be able to say exactly that, the, for example, the KMAX readings obtained from these subgroups uh, could be the same ones that we'd be able to get if we were to use African uh, subjects, for instance, in the study. Also, uh, the ability to carry out the measurements as they did. So here, if we look at aspects such as um, the, the, the use of a topographer, we might not be able to have these facilities readily available on hand in our environment. And also, maybe there would be need for us to consider other ways that we could um, uh, be able to assess natural progression other than uh, the use of this machinery. But in terms of this particular study, in terms of this particular study, they have already established that um, the other measures that they use, like visual acuity, the event, the 12 month um, maximum, the maximum infraction that they established, these were less sensitive in comparison to the to the uh, readings, the KMAX readings that they obtained. So this also would be a challenge um, if this study was to be carried out. But certainly it's something that's uh, worth considering also, and maybe establishment of a protocol for how we could best um, see how we can establish uh, measures that would be more beneficial for us in Zambia would also help us. Thank you very much for your attention. And my presentation ends here. Thank you very much, Dr. Chansa, and uh, we appreciate your presentation. And thank you for keeping within fairly good time. So I will open up the discussion now for questions to Dr. Chansa, any comments people may have about this study or about keratoconus. And we probably give that about another maybe 10 or 15 minutes. There was a hand that was raised by Dr. Tendai. Uh, sorry, I accidentally raised my hand.
Any other questions or comments? Um, I see Dr. Cindy Ogundo would like to ask a question. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Chancellor, for your um, very good presentation. I was just wondering, um, maybe a lot of people here are not very familiar with statistics and skip that part when reading journals. Would you mind explaining um, like the heterogeneity and the I squared that you were presenting to us, just so that people understand what's going on and what those figures mean? So, okay, I don't know if I need to go back to some of the graphs, or maybe I can just talk about it generally. If you can show the graph, that would be nice. Okay. So, maybe I can use this graph as an example. So, for um, heterogeneity, we are talking about the, the variations in the studies. So we know that a meta-analysis has various studies that have been included, and um, the studies are, are weighted, all the studies are weighted um, based on, um, the, I don't know if I can say the number of studies that were included in that particular, the information that was included. I can put it like that. So heterogeneity basically talk, it tells us the variations in the studies that are included. And then the I squared gives us how high or low uh, that uh, variation is. So if we have an I squared value, which is greater than 50%, it shows that there's a high um, heterogeneity. And if it's less than, then the heterogeneity was low. And so if, if the heterogeneity is high, it makes us question a bit on terms of um, the study findings that we get. I don't know if I've answered it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gishui. Um, maybe you could go to the first, the first um, forest plot before this one. Okay. Yeah, this, yeah, that one. Sorry? The forest plot, the first one. Oh. I think it's the next slide. Yes, it's this one. Yeah, so I think this kind of shows that concept a little better because you may, if you just look at the studies from the Middle East, you can see that the summary result of the four studies has a very wide confidence interval but if you look at the little, the little boxes represent the summary effect of that study, for, for each study. And you can see that those black boxes are kind of spread around. They don't overlap very well. And that shows you that there's a lot of variation in what is being measured. Then if you look at the next group of European studies, again, you see the boxes are sort of scattered all over the place and you can see that the confidence intervals don't overlap. The confidence intervals are those lines you see across each box. I'm going to just cover a little bit of that during my presentation. Um, but even just eyeballing, you look and you can see that the boxes are all over the screen. And that tells you that this group of studies are not, uh, they didn't, their estimates kind of varied so much from each other. And that basically gives you an idea of how much heterogeneity there is. So why is there heterogeneity or why are there differences? It may simply be the patients that were studied, they may vary in some form or other by age, maybe by severity of disease, maybe they would they study heterogeneity. But generally, because a meta-analysis is supposed to summarize things, it means here we are generally lumping together things. But thank you, Dr. Chasa. Thank you. Um, is there any, any other question or comment that somebody would like to make?
preferably I'd like to hear from somebody in Zambia. This was mainly meant to be for the your CME for your residence in, in Zambia, but we're not locking out anyone. Any question or comment is highly welcome. Any comments, okay. Dr. Samba? I can see. Uh, was that hand up, Dr. Samba? Dr. No, Samba? no, 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 it's not. <laughs> it looks like they understood the presentation very well, pretty well. Dr. Mumbi, I was about to ask whether it's always this quiet or is it because the Kenyans have invaded? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, no, not really, I think. Not really. I think um, the meta analysis is one of those topics that are a little bit confusing, and uh, most members are hearing it for the first time. I'm assuming, yeah. So that's uh, one of the reasons why we decided to have it so that we can have clarity. So I still think I, I still feel that there must be a question, one or two uh, comments, or you know, from where we have so many members in the who who, who are participating. I've not seen any question in the chat in the chat group also. Uh, if there's any question, you can just write them and then read them at the end of the presentation. Perhaps Dr. Gishu may proceed to the presentation. We have about 15 minutes or so. So thank you very much. Uh, what I'll do is I'll make my presentation and probably there may be questions um, after that presentation. Um, so can I share my screen? Uh, yes, yes, you can. Uh, you can share, yes. Uh, sorry, wrong one. Is that visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I suspect the reason there may be no questions is if this is the first time people are hearing about systematic reviews and meta-analysis, it may sound very new. Um, so I'll just briefly look at what systematic reviews are and you know what kind of information can they give us and a very simple overview of how it is done. Uh, although if you read the journal, you can the paper, you can see that in the method section, they described well. But this might probably help you understand why they said some of the things they said. And then just again, very briefly, what to look for in meta-analysis. Um, a systematic review is essentially a summary of primary studies, uh, which aims to answer a very specific question. And uh, the question has to be defined before. And the idea is to summarize and collect all the available evidence to help us to answer that question. And usually we use uh, pre-specified eligibility criteria, like most studies. Now, you may have a systematic review with meta-analysis or without. <clears throat> and the meta-analysis uh, is basically a way of using statistical methods to calculate a summary measure as it were. So what can a systematic review tell us? Um, we are clinicians and I, we always should try to relate research to clinical practice. Um, I think we live with this dichotomy and people say, you know, I'm a practitioner, I'm not a researcher. And I don't think that should be the case. And certainly for residents, that's where we are learning how to combine or use research in, with our, in, in our clinical practice. So whenever you see a patient, um, there are various types of questions you'll come across. And uh, some of the questions may initially probably be, you know, what is wrong with the patient? What, what is the diagnosis here? You have listened to the history, you have examined, you probably want to run a few tests or have run the tests already. And the question really you're answering is primarily what is wrong? 
And uh, sometimes, depending on how common the problem is, you can say, oh yeah, you know, in this area, we see malaria a lot, maybe that's what the patient has. Or you might say, oh, we have found keratoconus, I don't see that a lot. Is that really possible? How common is this problem? You can have questions about what are the risk factors. So like, you know, particularly for this review, they were looking at progression and trying to find out, so who is likely to progress and who is not. There may be questions on treatment, you know, what treatment is effective, which treatment should we use, should we treat or not treat. Um, questions about harms or adverse effects of treatment can also come up during our discussions. Uh, prognosis, what happens, you know, if a patient has keratoconus and I don't treat them, what is going to happen? Are they going to progress or not? If I treat using whichever method, what is a long-term effect? So questions on prognosis can also arise, and perhaps even in the end when you're discharging the patient, you might also want to ask questions about how could we have prevented this? Can we start detecting early? What can we do to screen patients so that we pick up these conditions early, like keratoconus? So systematic reviews could actually help you to answer all these questions. So the one we've studied today basically focuses on reviews that were, it was a review on the prognosis or what is the long-term outcome. Now, a question then arises. So people like to use the words, you know, this is evidence-based, this is evidence-based, but you know, we need to agree on what is good evidence or what is uh, valid evidence. So we need to, have to be agreed that this is acceptable evidence. Lawyers do the same in court. So generally, if you're looking at a diagnostic question, the types of studies that evaluate diagnostic tests or diagnostic methods would mostly be cross-sectional studies and randomized controlled trials, perhaps to a lesser extent. If you want to answer the question, how common is this problem? Um, you know, we all know that we need to look at population surveys or cross-sectional studies done in hospitals or other health institutions or in any geographical setting. Questions about what causes the disease or what puts you at risk of getting the disease. Uh, generally, the best evidence would be found from case control studies. And these are good because you can actually study multiple factors. As, randomized control trial. Yeah. As cause, causation of the uh, disease. Um, then uh, you can use cohort studies. Um, they are also good, but the one weakness with a cohort study is that generally, most cohort studies will probably be able or be powered for one exposure and not two. So there are limitations there, but yes, they can be used. For the efficacy of a treatment, randomized control trials are obviously the gold standard. Um, and when you're looking at harms, again, you're looking at long-term effects, so cross-sectional studies, case control studies, but depending also on what you're looking at, uh, sometimes you may also just use case reports. I should have included that. So for example, when you do phase four market surveillance of drugs, usually you are told if you, you, if you see or observe an effect that you think was related to the use of, you know, hydroxyquinolone is, I mean, hydroxychloroquine is probably one of the subjects of the world right now, then you can report those cases. Then prognosis, what happens? The best evidence again would be from uh, cohort studies because they tend to follow up people uh, very systematically for a fairly long period with regular assessments. You could use randomized control trials and I think in this uh, review you can see they used randomized control trials. Uh, the challenge there becomes if I want to look at prognosis of an untreated group then I would be using the placebo arm of or the control arm of that randomized trial. And I'll make some comments at the end about this review and see why that may or may not be a problem. Uh, for screening, various designs can be used depending on what kind of evaluation you're doing. Um, so just looking at reviews that look at the efficacy of treatment, um, there's a hierarchy of treatment, of, there's a hierarchy of evidence uh, from you know, the weak or the, some of the worst evidence to some of the best evidence. Um, of course, the lowest being, you know, anecdotal stories that we like telling, you know, whenever you see a patient you treated in a particular way and something went really bad, you say, I never use this, this one patient who I treated like this and something went wrong. Um, you know, things you read in newspapers are probably written by journalists. Um, some of you might be surprised why reports of expert committees are 
fairly down, found very low on the chart. Expert committees, you know, even if you look at the way expert committees are selected, there tends to be a lot of bias in the selection of who we consider experts. Uh, so all the way up, and the best evidence really would be a systematic review of randomized control trials. And I should also say that when you're looking at evidence for prognosis or risk factors, then at the top of each of those clinical questions we talked about would really be a systematic review of those kinds of studies, even of diagnostic tests. And um, some of you may have heard of the Cochrane Collaboration. The Cochrane Collaboration is organized into groups. There's an eyes and vision group, there's you know, child, child care and obstetrics groups. So there are groups that are actually uh, centered around, focused around particular diseases. And so you can do a systematic review to look at risk factors. You can do a systematic re review of diagnostic tests. There's one group that's actually called a diagnostic test group. So the point there is that if you look at more studies, you get better information than single individual studies. Um, usually you say buyer beware, not all reviews are systematic. And uh, I don't know which of those two pictures you think shows systematic loading of weight, uh, but one may say that the picture on the left, that truck is probably not a very systematic way of loading, although there appears to be some form of semblance, the luggage is down and people are on top. Uh, but you know, if you're looking at difficulties in transportation, probably the lady on the right hand side is doing a much better job at being systematic in arranging the luggage that she has to carry and the people that she needs to transport. But the point here is that not all reviews are systematic. And we are not saying reviews which are not systematic are bad. And I'll just show you some few examples. So if you look at reviews in general, which is the big white black circle on the outside, um, some reviews are systematic. And the reviews which are not systematic are also called overviews. Some systematic reviews may have meta-analysis and some may not. And I'll mention later on why you can do a meta-analysis and why some reviews are not amenable to, to meta-analysis. So what makes a review systematic? The keyword is system. Usually you focus on one area or one question. Uh, so they tend to cover a very narrow scope. You generally want to do a comprehensive search of all available literature, including the great literature. And I think you could see that in this review, the author has mentioned that they even use some software that scouts around great literature. And gray could be, you know, unpublished work, dissertations, uh, papers that, or letters that may have been written to magazines and other publications that we may not consider mainstream science textbooks. Um, explicitly stated search strategy. And that usually has to be stated before. Uh, where did you search? Or in fact, usually you do this before. What will you search? Where will you search? How will you search? The selection of studies that will be included in the analysis is also based on an explicit criteria. You don't sort of ad hoc find one down the line and say, oh, this looks very interesting. We should include it. And then there's a system of rigorously appraising those studies. And then you can decide in step six whether to do a meta-analysis or not. When you have all the studies you want to include, can these be summarized together? Can they not be? So for example, somebody asked a question on heterogeneity. If the heterogeneity is so much, the studies are so scattered, it may not make sense to try and make a summary measure. It will really be trying to make an average of oranges and apples. And then finally, you make interpretations uh, based on the evidence you have found. Um, so, I just looked for examples of Keratoconus reviews, and I came across this one, um, which is the entitled Pediatric Keratoconus, a review of the literature. So if you just look at the abstract, you can see that their purpose was to describe the epidemiology and prevalence, rates of progression, difference between adult and pediatric populations, therapeutic approaches to pediatric keratoconus from documented literature. So even from the abstract, I can tell this is probably not a systematic review. Uh, it's probably going to end up being an overview of different things. 
uh, because you can see there are a lot of questions that they want to cover. And I did look at this paper. Um, I also saw another one, which uh, still on keratoconus was entitled a review of keratoconus, diagnosis, pathophysiology, and genetics. And when you look at the contents or the outline of that paper on the right hand side of the slide, you can see they were going to discuss diagnosis, classification systems, you know, who progresses and who doesn't, pathophysiology, genetics, and future directions. So it's a very wide scope of material to be covered. There is no particular clinical question they are trying or specific question they are trying to answer. Now, we are not saying reviews that are not systematic are not good reviews. Because actually, you will find, especially if you're just delving into a subject, trying to see or to learn broadly about a subject, these kind of reviews are actually very useful. And they can be very informative, um, particularly for, especially for residents. Uh, if you want to have an idea of, you know, what's the field of keratoconus, you've never heard of keratoconus. These are very good papers to read. So they're useful. They have their part in the literature. Uh, but they will generally give you an overview, and then from there, you can start asking specific questions related to your patient. So if you are to conduct a review, what are the steps towards conducting a review? Um, so first, you need a rationale. And what is, what is the problem you're facing? So let's assume, for example, from the paper we looked at today, that the rationale was you know, some people seem to progress and others don't seem to progress. So who progresses and who does not and what may be a predictor to progression. Then, then you need to have a review team. And usually for systematic reviews, you are advised to have two or more people. And that's really to avoid bias and to be able to find ways of resolving conflicts about selection of studies. Then formulate the problem as a question. We don't have too much time to delve into this. Um, I'm quite happy to do this in another session. But you know, you may have heard of some of these mnemonics like PICO, PO, and PEO. PICO basically is just you know who is the patient, the intervention, the comparison, and the outcome. That's good for trials if the question is about intervention. Um, you may want, for example, to look at uh, say prognosis, and you will use the last one, the patients the exposure and the outcome. So in a patient with keratoconus or who's got very high levels of keratoconus, of KMAX, for example, uh, what is the probability that they are going to progress where the progression is your outcome? Um, then you quickly search and find, out, first of all, the review you intend to do, has it been done before? Because if it's been done, then what you need to do is actually use a critical appraisal tool like we used today. Uh, so just because a review has been done before doesn't mean that it's been done well. And that's why we learn critical appraisal. You may very well find one published, do a critical appraisal and find that, oh, there is still a gap. So for example, the review we looked at today, uh, you noticed that there were no African patients. Is that to say we don't have keratoconus? No, we have keratoconus. Um, is it likely that our patients with keratoconus may differ from keratoconus in other parts of the world? Perhaps, um, you know, we know, for example, allergic conjunctivitis is a disease that's often associated with keratoconus. We think there is a lot more allergy and probably more severe allergy in Africans and in other populations. So one may perhaps say, maybe we have a rationale for doing another one, another review or conducting studies if we don't find any studies. And perhaps thinking uh, the review present didn't include Africans, so we need to see are there studies that included Africans? And if you don't find studies, then you have a perfect rationale for actually conducting a study in among Africans. If you find no review has been done, then you write a protocol of how you'll do it. And generally you are encouraged to register the reviews before. Uh, there are various registries you could use. Prospero is one, Cochrane is probably one of the biggest used in the world. And you might wonder, why do I have to review? First of all, a protocol that is uh, registered is, is a publication. So they actually do publish them. And the idea is just like we do randomized control trials and register the, you have to register the protocols before, you specifically state your methods. And that is to avoid you changing methods down the road, depending on what you find. Uh, so usually you're encouraged to register them before. 
then you do a comprehensive search of all the literature. There's a very elaborate way the search uh, is designed and we don't have the time to look at that today. Then you extract the data using pre-designed uh, extraction sheets, which I, I think you get enough practice doing those with your MED projects. And eight is quite crucial. Um, unlike most reviews where people say, oh, I looked and found 10 studies and these 10 studies, this is what they said, and you summarize them in a table. Uh, the idea is actually to do a critical appraisal of each of those studies. And that's where we teach critical appraisal to residents so that you'll be, a, you'll be a better consumer of literature. And some of the things that you assess in these studies include, you know, is there a risk of bias in this paper? Is there a publication bias when I look at all the papers that I have found? Then finally, you can compile them together into an analysis, meta-analysis, and uh, you write your report. And some of the things that you see there include forest plots and final plots, and I think we have been shown some today, and I'll just cover those in a short while. So briefly, those are the steps to a review. Reviews take a long time to do. Reviews are research in and of themselves. Um, people think, oh, you know, you're just reviewing research that was done by other people. You know, I'll tell you, I've published, uh, I've been, I'm an author on three Cochrane reviews, and I actually stopped, I don't want to publish anymore. Because the work of writing, say, a Cochrane review, from start to end is a process that takes about two years. It's very long. And when they are published, at least in the Cochrane database, you're obligated to keep updating them every three years, every five years or so. So once your name is on it, you have to keep updating it so that people who read it are always reading the latest literature. And you know that also reminds me that I have one that I need to keep updating. And that's when I realized I can't keep putting my name on all of them. So this is a lot of work to actually conduct a review. So what are some of the methods we use in assessing reviews and some of them you have seen today? So you put down your findings and uh, one of the things that you'll then look at is what is the effect measure? So in this case, they had many measures they were looking at. The, you know, what are the different, how are we going to define progression? Is it by the visual acuity? Is it by the K marks? Is it by the thinning of the cornea? Is it by the mean keratometry? Many parameters. So what are those effect measures? And you need to have decided before. The other thing you look at in a meta-analysis is heterogeneity, and we looked briefly at one of the graphs that showed us that. You also want to look at publication bias. All the studies you have found, is there a bias? And I'll show you what that means in a minute. And then quality assessment and sensitivity analysis. Um, you know, is there a bias? Is there a confounding? Uh, and there are things like meta-degradation which are done, which we are not going to discuss today. What are the measures of effect that you should be looking for? So for example, using keratoconus, um, you will have decided before that I'm going to probably use continuous outcomes like the K-max, which is the mean dioptery change in one year in the different uh, studies. And so the measure of effect there would be a standardized mean difference. You may want to just simply ask, in one year, do patients progress, who progressed and who did not progress? So it's a yes, no, which is a binary response. And there you can estimate using an odds ratio or relative risk. Or you can say, I'm going to review survival. What proportion of patients progress in one year? And I'm going to compare people who are younger versus older and different things like that, whatever exposures you want to look at. And you can summarize that with a hazard ratio. But the key thing is that if you want to do a good review, you generally want to compare two or more groups because remember back to our situation of clinical questions. The questions we ask, are questions that generally are about making a choice. Why are you asking about diagnosis? What does this patient have? Do they have disease A or disease B? Who progresses? Do people progress? How many progress? Do they not progress? What treatment should I use? Should I use treatment A or treatment B? Or should I treat or not treat? Where the not treating would be the equivalent. So you know you look for what would be happening in the placebo arms of trials. So good analytical research generally is about making comparisons because that's what life is about. It's not just describing that 25 people got this disease, then what? There has to be an application to that information. So why do we do a meta-analysis? Um, meta-analysis, when you're able to do them, they are good because they provide a test with more power than just having a separate studies. Um, uh, and then you can summarize. We have a lot of noise in the background. People mute, please. Um, a meta-analysis can also help you to investigate consistency of effect across different samples. I think somebody asked a question about heterogeneity and that's what it is. So we are going to see that in a minute. So in summary, 
what we see on our right hand side is what is called a forest plot. Uh, and this is taken from the review we have just discussed today. So a forest plot essentially is a simple graph that has an x-axis, which is a line you see right across the bottom with a scale, and it's marked mean change in diopters. And that is a line where you write your measure of effect. So for example, you want to look at what was the mean change in the K-max of these patients. And then it has a vertical dotted line. In this case, it is on zero. That vertical line is what we call a line of null effect or a line of no effect. Now, every study that you report will either fall on the right-hand side of this line or on the left-hand side of this line, or it may cross if it is some seated across the middle of the line. That line of no effect, for example, in this case, where the mean change is zero, it means there was no change in the diopters, in the K-max of that patient. So if you look at, for example, uh, the Middle East group, this study by Orr in 2018 had 40 eyes and the summary measure, so we read from left to right. The summary measure was that in this study, the mean change of the patients, you might see it numerically here, was 1.2 diopters. And that is shown as a black square there. And if you go right down the axis here, you'll see that that comes to about 1.2. And then the confidence interval for this study was 1.09 to 1.31. That is shown as these whiskers across that box. So 1.09 on the left-hand side there, if you bring it down, would be just about there. And the other one, the upper limit, 1.31, if we go vertically down again, we come here to about 1.3. So that is all. And the next study had 22 eyes, and you can see the summary measure was 2.2 diopters change. So these ones seem to show more progression. The mean change was bigger. Uh, they also have a wider confidence interval, you'll notice. And the same, we come and find another study with a different result here. And you can see this one had a different result here. So what is the direction of effect is the first question. The direction of effect is basically asking is, for example, these studies, if the ones we've just looked at in the Middle East, are they on the right-hand side of the dotted line or on the left-hand side? And we can see they're on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side means come to the x-axis here. The mean change is positive, means these people progressed, their keratoconus got worse. Mm. For the people who have a result on the left-hand side, then it means the cornea is flattened. And you can see that in this group from the Middle East, the direction of effect was mainly progression. What is the size of effect? Let's just look at the Middle East group of studies. The summary measure of effect is shown by this black diamond. And you'll notice these diamonds have different shapes there, 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 and I'll explain why. So that diamond is a summary measure of the average of 1, 2, 0 0.4, and 1.14. Not a numerical average, or a mathematical average, but a weighted mean. So some of you may wonder why are some black boxes bigger, some have small, that's a bit bigger, and this one is quite big. The size of the box is a measure of how much weight this study carries in this group of four studies, which are summarized by that meta-analysis. A big box shows that the study had bigger weight. Bigger weighting is given by studies that have either got a fairly large sample size, so like you can see these studies have 52, 50, compared to some of the smaller ones, like 22. And also, it's not just a factor of the size of the study, but also with the precision of measurements. So these studies had very precise measurements and you can see the precision is shown by the narrow confidence intervals that you see on that box. This study on the other hand had even bigger than 52, than 50, it has 52. But you see the box there is smaller than this one. Why? Because the measurements in this study had much more variation. The precision was not as good. The confidence intervals here are much wider than you see in this study so that you can see this is why this study has been given a smaller weighting because the precision was wide. This study has the widest confidence interval. So that study is given the smallest weighting. And usually, again, we always say that if you look at when you're designing your studies, studies with small sample size generally tend to have a lot more error in estimations. So they have wider confidence intervals. And the same now with this other study that we see up here. It's a bigger study, more precise, bigger square. So the average of this square and this and this and this is weighted and the average comes to the middle of the diamond 
which in we see it in small print here is 1.33. Um, 1.23. And if you take that straight down here, you can see it comes to about there. Now, the confidence interval of the summary estimate is the end of this diamond here and the right hand end on this side, which you see is 0.52 and 1.94. If you, again, you take this right down, you can read it is just about 0.52. And this other one shows you the extreme end. So you can see that the pattern of the Middle East studies is summarized there. The summary of the summary of the European studies is shown here. Then the studies from Asia is shown here, and you can see why they were stratifying these studies by region, because we also know that there's a genetic component to keratoconus, and maybe some races or groups of populations have higher risk of progression than others, which is what we tend to see here. And now, when you look at all those studies that were available. Notice Africa is missing. There was no study from America. I don't see any study from Australia. So the summary measure of these, all these studies together is shown in this diamond here. And you can see that this diamond is narrower than the bigger diamonds because now you have more studies. This diamond is summarizing more studies. And so the sample sizes are bigger. And you can see that on average, the progression in these patients was the middle of here, drops here, and this numerical result is written there. I hope that now helps us make sense of meta-analysis forest plots. So what is the size of the effect, number two? The size of the effect of progression was that on average they found in all the studies, the average progression was 0.72 diopters, the mean change. Is the effect consistent across studies or heterogeneity? And you can see that if we look by region, even Middle East, there's a lot of variation there. Again, Europe, quite a bit of variation there. I would say the studies from East Asia were more homogeneous. There's less heterogeneity. They tend to be very close together. Their confidence intervals overlap. And so is the effect consistent across studies? My answer generally here would be no, it is not. There's too much variation. So eyeballing is one of the first reasons. And then you may also want to know why was there a variation? It might just simply, in this case, the clearest suggestion is that it's a regional variation, which means maybe genetic, racial, or other factors that may be at play. And there are some statistics, oh, sorry. There are some statistics that are used to estimate heterogeneity. Uh, usually they're hidden away in a little bottom left-hand corner here, and you can see heterogeneity. There's a Q-score with some degrees of freedom, and a p-value here, which they didn't give us. So that was one of the critiques I had of this paper. Um, maybe somebody made a mistake when they were plotting the forest plot because you, you use software and they didn't show the p-value. But the p-value could tell you whether there's significant heterogeneity or not. But the other measure, which is probably the least reliable of heterogeneity, is a small measurement that you can see next to p called i squared. And this one is 99.2%. Generally, more than 50% means we have too much heterogeneity. So clearly, 99.2% was a lot of heterogeneity, and you can see it shows there. So last question, what is the strength of the evidence? You know, what is the quality assessment of the studies? The forest plot will not tell you that. But again, when I look at this, the strength of the evidence for my conclusion is that we don't have very good evidence for the estimate of this progression because we have lumped together studies from very many different areas with a lot of variation. Um, the other thing we look for in the systematic review is also reporting bias. There are various types of reporting bias, but the most common is called publication bias. Some people call it the file drawer problem. Uh, this one mainly applied to trials. When you do a small trial that didn't show effect, you probably struggled to get it published. All the journals rejected it and you left it alone. It wasn't published. So only trials that show effect get published. And the person who does a review will then be overestimating the effect of a treatment because the studies that showed at no positive result never got published. Um, in uh, studies, especially like prognostic studies like we were looking at here, you can have things like time lag bias, um, you know, studies took too long to get published. Some studies followed up people for 20 years and others followed for one year. Uh, location bias, I think we saw the effect of geographical areas. There's a lot of citation bias in science. There's a lot of politics in medical science. It's not as objective as we like. So, and before you accuse others, you should always think of yourself. 
the last time you went on PubMed and you were looking for literature and you found some studies written, and it says there are article in Chinese, the authors are, are, are from China, and you opened the paper and it was written in Chinese, you, you left it alone. You never, you didn't cite that one. Does it mean the Chinese don't do good science? No. So we also do a lot of citation bias ourselves. There's language bias with, you know, you cite work of people you know, sound like, you know, famous scientists or famous doctors. Uh, if you see a name you've never heard of, I don't think I'll cite this one. You pick studies in English and leave out the ones in Chinese and Russian. Um, selective reporting of outcomes. You had four outcomes, but reported two. There's a lot of that. There's a way of assessing this in all the studies you have included. And that is what is called a funnel plot. The funnel plot basically plots the odds ratio on the x-axis and the effect of precision or study size on the y-axis. Remember the precision or study size was what we saw as the size of that big black box in the forest plot. So when you plot those studies, on the x-axis, the odds ratio, in this case, this was an odds ratio. You may have a hazard ratio or whatever you are looking at, even a mean change in diopters where the scale might be at uh, negative all the way to zero. But remember that there's a vertical line, in the odds ratio, the vertical line will be at one. A relative risk vertical line will be at one. If it's prevalence, maybe at zero. A mean change, zero, that's where the line would be, then you have negative. So this vertical line basically tells us that if, for example, we are looking at the odds ratio of uh, a treatment being effective, there are more studies on the left-hand side of this line than on the right-hand side. But in general, you can see that studies that showed an effect and those that didn't show an effect, I'm sorry, I'm confusing with this black line. It should be this middle line here. So we have studies on both sides of this tent. That tells me there's no reporting bias. There are studies that reported an effect, there are studies that didn't report an effect. But pay particular attention to that line. If you see studies here, that means then we have studies that actually can show an effect, and that means you should be careful with your interpretation. You may see final plots that look like this. And now you see that there's a blank area there on the right hand side. That tells you we don't have studies that didn't show effect or showed effect. Um, that a odds ratio that is above one if you're looking at harmful effects, for example. So that tells you there's reporting bias. So be careful when you're that when you are assessing that. So very briefly, I think we've covered what systematic reviews are, what they tell us, uh, how they are done, and I took a little long on that, and what to look for in a meta-analysis, which now I hope will help you uh, probably better look again at that paper when you're assessing whether it was a good review or not. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen now and ask for any questions or comments. And I hope this time there'll be questions or comments. Thank you very much. Dr. Mumbi, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Gishui. It has really opened up the minds of many. And uh, I think uh, one of the challenges that I had when I finished my, my, my training I went to a place where I was literally alone and the challenges I had was um, how do I manage this um, without relying entirely on the knowledge that I acquired during my training. So I literally embarked upon myself trying to understand what systemic reviews were and meta analysis. So it was from there that from that time I've been using them quite often if I'm trying to answer a question in my clinical judgment. Uh, so it's really very helpful not only for for the residents, but also I think for the practicing ophthalmologists, and this I think tradition should need to, to carry on. Uh, Dr. Mansaluea uh, has the hand up. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, greetings. That was uh, such a wonderful presentation. And I think you've uh, illuminated a number of things that are quite critical, especially for upcoming scientists. Um, I've got a couple of I've got a couple of, uh, well, I'm seeking clarification on a couple of things. Uh, one of them is that um, when you're searching databases, when you're planning to search databases, how do you, is there a limit or a general guide to how many you should search for you to come up? And, uh, Dr. Yeah. Massa, we can't so, hear you. Could you could you kindly repeat the question? There, there was a break. 
the, okay, the so the first part. question is, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can I and, and repeat the last part of the question? We can hear you. So the first question is, uh, is there a limit to the number of uh, databases that you should search once you establish your method, as you establish your, your methodology? That's number one. Number two, uh, strategies to access um, a gray literature, how and where to really find it so that it's part of your reviews. Uh, number three, uh, you'll probably look around uh, They will say that one of the features that are good about it is that it shows you how many times the paper has been cited. So a paper which has been cited a lot more times is what you should look for because those are like the authorities in that field. So I'd like to um, hear um, how you balance between citation bias and really getting the voices of those people who are like experts in the field. I'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Um, so I'll try, I think I had, if I had correctly, there was three areas that you, want, you wanted some clarification. One was on databases. How wide should you search? Um, remember the objective is to search all available literature. And the point is really to show that you have made the effort. So first of all, there are some very good registries of a lot of studies, um, including things like CINAHL. Um, Things like uh, some databases, databases like CINAL, which include, uh, you know, Spanish literature, Portuguese literature. Uh, so there's a lot of non-English literature that's already existing in those registries. You need to show you have searched them. Um, you need to show that you have gone through the effort of picking up literature from other countries. So, for example, I used to work in a Cochrane Eyes and Vision group we would search for studies which are even in Chinese and send them to a Chinese ophthalmologist in China, in the Chinese Cochrane Center, to translate them. And you want to show that I have gone to the effort of finding all the work. Now, gray literature. There is, um, you may have read in this review that they use something called gray, I forget the word. There's a software for searching gray literature. And it actually scouts around and picks up a lot of what is unpublished. Go also to databases like, for example, the Africa Journal Online. We have many journals, for example, in Africa, which don't get cited on PubMed. But if you go there, they'll be able to tell you which are these journals, and then you go and search for them. Um, so the idea is to be as comprehensive at, as possible. There is no line that they draw and say, yes, no, you did or you did not do a comprehensive search. But the idea is to show that I tried and this is what I obtained. One of the very useful hints of being able to pick up all the literature is once you find one paper, go to the reference list of that paper and also see what other studies may have been done that I may have missed. So the reference lists of whatever you find are also very useful places to find more, more, more literature. Um, a question about citation bias and authority. So one presumes that people who go to do systematic reviews or a doctor who's asking a clinical question around the patient is open-minded. And open-minded means, uh, I think you, you, you don't have a, you don't have a pre, predetermined position on whether this works or it doesn't work or whether this progresses or doesn't progress. And that also means you cannot be influenced by the fact that you know, so and so is considered an authority in this field. Um, remember, even if you say a paper has been cited a hundred times or a million times, when you're designing your study selection criteria, you are going to select a study that included the following participants and assess the following outcomes. Now, if it happens to be that that paper was written by this eminent scholar, however eminent they are, their paper is selected only once. And you cannot put more weight to their data than data from another study. And that is why actually we pre-design all these methods so that you pick all the studies are treated equally. And it is the objectivity of the information that is actually put on the analysis table. So there is no room actually for picking people who have been cited a hundred times or not. In a review, that study is only included once. 
or it is selected once. Um, I think there was also another question you asked about uh, bias. Um, yeah, we do tend to have bias in the way we select our studies, but that is what we really do try to counteract using systematic reviews. And that's where reviews are considered better than single author papers. I mean, uh, single uh, publications. They may be having many authors as a team. And the number of times we cite, we've just, you know, we are human. We are biased in who we think is considered. So remember who you consider an, an, authority, an authority in a field may not be what people consider an authority elsewhere. Uh, people who are authorities in Russia, some of them you don't even know. So we have to keep bias out of the site. And that's, by the way, one of the major criteria of assessing the quality of a review of studies. Was there risk of bias or not? There are some explicit tools used to assess it, but uh, we didn't have time to cover those today. And I hope maybe we'll have an opportunity another time. But thank you for the question. Very nice question, especially for researcher if you're thinking of doing reviews. Uh, there's also another question that is similar, Dr. Gishoi. Yeah, it's from Dr. Funjika. She's asking for systemic reviews. How does one determine the minimum number of journals to consider? For example, she says uh, there are 3,000 journals. Uh, uh, they reviewed about 3,000 journals, but only for one were systemically re reviewed. So again, there is no minimum number. Remember, the keyword is all. You want to find all the literature available. Now, you may wonder, so how does one, you know, just the logistics of looking at 3,000 studies, that's a lot of work. You will find that, I know we didn't have time for this, if you have specified your question very explicitly, then, and I've worked in review groups before, you first get 3,000, you first search on PubMed, for example, and all these databases, and you have now got a list of 3,000 titles of papers. One of the first things we use is just the title of the paper. From the title of the paper, or just looking at the title and the abstract, you can tell this is not a systematic review. But the abstract should tell you, and usually some of the criteria you list is that the study must include uh, some certain parameters in the title and abstract. So usually then you can scan through, and that's why again we use review teams, not one person. I'd be very skeptical about, actually it will be, very unusual to find a systematic review authored by one person published. You need a team of people because that's a lot of work to do. So scan through all those papers and initially it is just a scanning through, scanning through the abstracts, trying to extract the data. The abstracts that say this was a randomized trial, but actually when you look through, you realize, oh no, it was not. So you screen them using that kind of criteria. And again, well-designed studies will also have very well-written abstracts then you may narrow down that and what you also do is you report all that on a flowchart like they did in this paper so that then you can show how you went from the big number down and distilled it to 41. 41 is even a lot um i have we I have worked in review teams i just didn't show some of the work here for example we're doing a meta-analysis of the global burden of disease of you know blindness and visual impairment in the whole world you start off with you know 12,000, 13,000 papers, you know, you're different people. But you can distill it down to very few papers because you have a very explicit criteria. You have asked a very focused question. So logistically, yes, they're difficult. There is no magic number that you need to reach, but you need to show that I have searched everything that is available. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I know we are overshot by 28 minutes. Uh, we're supposed to spend one. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, but uh, fortunately, it's one of those um, uh, classes, if I put it, that we really uh, benefit from and that uh, will last long. So I'm just aging everyone. When you go back, try to read the, the paper again and read it with this background. And you can get further information. There's so much information available. And do not leave the information to pile up, continue using it and practicing, even for a small uh, thing like how to treat dry eyes, you, you are going to, to answer the question and try to practice it. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gishui for spending time with us and also Dr. Mebo for presenting, um, and Dr. Fujika for the support. I'd like uh, just the uh, presenters and the moderator and also Dr. Fujika to make the closing remarks uh, in under two minutes, I think, and then we'll call it a day.
Dr. Mabel, we can start with you and then uh, Dr. Funchka and then Dr. Kishori. Okay. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone who found the time to tune in to this week's journal club presentation. And I hope it was educative. We learned something from it. For me, it was definitely educative, and uh, I've learned a lot from Dr. Kishu. And I thank him very much for uh, accepting to be my moderator. And I've gained a lot of knowledge. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to everyone that has. Uh, tuned in to listen to this interesting presentation on meta-analysis. It's not every day that we get to listen to statistical presentations. And I think what we've learned presented by Dr. Chanta, Dr. Gishui, very, very delightful. The presentation was so interesting that we didn't even notice that we had overshot the time allocated for the presentation. I'm hoping we'll get another chance to review another journal together so that we keep on learning because the learning always continues. Thank you so much for everyone that has participated and special thanks to our moderator Dr. Bishou. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to everybody who attended. Uh, and my apologies, you see, I, I was in a very awkward position. I was not quite functioning like a moderator. I was more like a presenter. Because <laughs> uh, usually when you're a moderator, you have an eye on the clock. Uh, but now I had this difficult situation where I was presenting towards the end. So actually I couldn't even, you know, look at my clock on the side here. Uh, so I apologize for the overextension of the time, but I hope that it was a reflection of interest. And I think my aim really here was just to spur interest and to make people feel systematic reviews are not mysterious. They are not difficult. Um, and actually they can be very nice tools for helping you answer some of the questions that you face in the wards, in the theaters with your patients every day. And thank you to the Zambia Ophthalmological Society for having me. And also you can see we had quite a huge contingent of Kenyans here, Kenyans in the diaspora. I can see some who are in London. Uh, this is probably testament of the fact that you, maybe we should do a little more of this in future together. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the participants who came and our colleagues from East Africa, Dr. Mundelai from uh, Mozambique, all the way. We thank you, everyone. We hope you can join us. And Dr. Kishri, we hope to call you again for another uh, topic that you may help us to moderate. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.